Hello. Hey, friends. Um, here we are. Uh, it's such a profound joy for me personally, for all of us at the lab, to welcome each and every one of you to this inaugural event, the gathering. We've never done this before. Um, and the culmination of our first Cross Currents Festival. I want to also welcome um, the folks um, listening in uh, around the world through our good friends at HowlRound, who we have a, such a long, deep relationship with, and say hello to those people. Uh, I have the, the really immense uh, pleasure and privilege of knowing almost all of you in one way or another, but for the few who I don't, I'm, I'm Derek. And with my colleague, Cynthia Schneider, I co-direct the Lab for Global Performance and Politics with a mission to harness the power of performance to humanize global politics. At the core of all of our work is a deep belief in the importance of relationship building, the power of our art form in all of its manifestations to bring people together across differences, to occasion necessary conversations about difficult issues, to offer an antidote uh, to the starvation for community and connection so many of us feel. We've been half joking, but it's actually, the sensation feels very real to me that it, this feels kind of like a global theater wedding. <laughs> um, the tent being the, the, I think, the kind of coup de grace of that, um, <laughs> that notion. Um, I personally am from a small biological family and I've always marveled at friends who speak of these great big family reunions where whole strands of the family previously unknown to them assemble. And this event feels a bit like that, a, a, a reunion of people, many of whom don't yet know each other, um, uh, but who from where we at the lab sit have an enormous amount to gain um, from coming together. And it really means the world to us that you have journeyed here today and for the next few days. Many of you from great distances, Sudan, Nigeria, Pakistan, Palestine and Israel, Australia, Lebanon, Cambodia, more than a dozen European countries, and so many regions of our own country and of our own city, our own metropolitan area of Washington. We gather in a very specific place with a very specific history at a very specific moment in time the group of people assembled here have many differences, but one thing we have in common, I'm certain, is a sense of caring deeply about the welfare of our world and striving to impact that world in our practices. As we gather, if someone were to ask the question broadly, how are things going in the world? <laughs> I think virtually everybody would find a great deal to lament to worry over, to grieve, and to rage about in this moment. So why are we here? Why have you traveled this distance, carved out time in your work week on a Wednesday afternoon? Um, I can assure you that not a single person attending or involved with this gathering is here for the money. <laughs> no one knows this better than me, and I know how much is happening here with how little thanks to each of you. The impulse that brings us together is rooted in action. We're doing something by gathering. This is meant not only as a reflective space, but with the hope of it being a catalytic space. The impulse is rooted, I dare say, in love, not in the soft, mushy sense, but in the sense that is tied to resistance in a world, woo, uh, I like that. We can howl in this space. In a world with so, so many challenges around us, that seem inextricably linked to human capacity for greed, violence, and hate. We come together to notice others and to be inspired by others who we may not have noticed previously as we toil in our own often stress-laden, isolated, under-resourced, exhausting spaces of practice. It's one of my beliefs that as much as we sometimes pat ourselves on the back in the arts for our largely progressive, open-minded ways of seeing the world, that our cultural spaces are still filled with hierarchies of judgment and silos that often keep even those of us who are doing transformative work 
in great alignment with each, each other from being aware of each other's work. I've come to feel that while at its core, theater's power is in its singular potential to break down us and them, we still have those insidious categories of us and them. And we reinforce that um, with the notion that there is a difference between work that is good and work that does good. Um, with the sense that real art is in the domain of people with a certain kind of training or a certain kind of access and that there is another usually considered inferior kind of socially engaged art. And my observation across the many performances I'm privileged to witness in radically different contexts from leading theaters and opera houses is that there are brilliant works uh, in those spaces as well as in prisons and in refugee camps and in high school auditoriums and in civic centers um, that do good and are good. Thank you. And in both places, in, in all of those spaces, there is work that is doing less good and, it's le and not so good. So I think a lot of, for me, what this, what this gathering is about is, is an attempt to try to, um, it, to um, come together uh, imagining a space free of some of those cultural hierarchies and silos. Um, here in DC, we have temples of politics and temples of culture, as we often say at the lab, and much of the work of the lab is about trying to create dynamism across those spaces to allow people to come together um, on an uh, equal footing. That is why this event is not a summit. We're not perched above anything. Um, we mean what we say that each student who is here um, or who may be listening somewhere is every bit as imp um, important to this gathering as the Nobel laureate and Pulitzer Prize winner and Booker Prize winner and Tony Award winner and ambassadors and secretaries of state that we're honored to welcome here in the next few days. It's also not a retreat. We're not here to withdraw our forces, but rather to gather them fueled by one another. Um, that has been one of our values in shaping these four days, and this shaping is an imperfect science. I assure you we have made a lot of mistakes, and we will continue to make them over the next few days. We've produced and hosted other events, um, but nothing like this, and some moments will be smoother than others, and many of you have already defied our well-calculated predictions about which events you were going to be wa wanting to be part of and what conversations would most interest you. So um, you may not all get into your first choice events, uh, especially if you didn't sign up right away, but just part of the vision of this gathering is that there will always be more to experience by looking next to you, going to the tent, having a drink, connecting. Um, we've tried to be led in all of our choices by our values um, of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, of working against real and perceived hierarchies, of experimentation, of community, we are also, of course, in many ways constrained by material realities, resources, the configurations of space, and bandwidth. Um, but every single person who's been part of putting this together, and you'll meet them all, uh, shares these values of wanting this to be as fruitful a few days um, as it can be for you. We'll be breaking bread at the tent, um, uh, uh, beginning with dinner this evening, and with uh, all the subsequent meals. Um, uh, I want to mention that the program, we're going to try really, really hard, I'm probably already breaking this rule, but it's really important to me, to stick to the time constraints for the next four days in the um, program, which is because there's no ch we, we, there is no chance we will feel finished at the end of any of our sessions. But in fairness to the amount of things we're trying to squeeze in, um, we hope and we've designed this so that conversations can continue and even that people who want to have a separate conversation parallel to the program, we can find a space and facilitate that and continue that conversation. Um, we have an incredible team and they're not all in this room now because they're doing other things, but I'd like you to just ask the, uh, a few of them to stand just to be sort of recognized now, both for the incredible work they're putting in, but so you can recognize them and continue to get to know them. Led by our lab programs manager and Cross Currents producer, Teddy Roger. <laughs> and Lil Lily Hughes, who's the associate producer of the gathering. Is Lily in this space right now? But you met her at registration and she's worthy of applause. Um, uh, 
this title doesn't even begin to cover what he does. Our, this, our incredible graduating senior lab programs assistant, but our kind of catch-all everything, Ali Pajwani. He's up there, thank you. The Cross Currents production manager in TD, who all of you who are engaging with performances has been working with, Michael Donay, is in the back. Our lab operations assistant, Jade T. Tavardovskaya, I think is uh, out there. She's amazing. And then, just in the, there's, and then that is not everybody. We have uh, Austin Eau Claire, who's been doing PR with us, and Laura Applebaum, and then this incredible team, Catherine Max, Adam, David, Daniel, Ariana, there are others, I think, who are making all of this possible. So this is, I want, uh, they're as much a part of this, and we'll be getting to know them over the next few years, but give them all a hand, please. And then also, and you'll meet them as part of this session, the, our amazing lab fellows who are sort of uh, assisting us. They are, our, they are our heart and soul in so many ways, and they are also um, your hosts uh, with us in this gathering. So please uh, ask them for support when you need it. Stand, guys. They're here. There are five, and we have ten fellows, five who are here more virtually at the moment. Um, so just to finish, I, will, I just would remind us that the word gather has a number of connotations. We come together, we assemble like we are, congregate. We it bring together and take in from scattered places and sources. We harvest, reap, glean. Um, we embrace or enfold like gathering a child in your arms. We develop a higher speed of something, like gathering, speed, uh, gathering pace or momentum. We intensify something. We understand. We think. We surmise. I gather from what you are saying. We summon up. We gather our thoughts or ideas. We refuel, and we draw and hold together, like gathering fabric. So I hope that these next four days have some aspects for all of you of all of these elements. Above all, and it feels like this already, I think this really should be and needs to be a celebration. In this place, in this time, as challenging as many of the issues we are all engaging and will continue to be engaging with are, um, and without being facile about those challenges as we connect, I think we can um, simultaneously notice and celebrate the small miracle of being held together in this global community over these next few days. Um, as part of this first session on why we are here, we wanted to spend some time acknowledging different aspects of where we are, where we have gathered, some of the implications of that history, what has transpired in this place. We're honored to have Emily Johnson, who as many of you know is an extraordinary dancer, writer, choreographer, among other things, organized the very impactful First Nations, di First Nations dialogues that are ongoing. Um, uh, and along with Jason Tamiru, um, fr with us from Malthouse Theatre in Melbourne, Australia. I'm a proud Yorta Yorta man, as he calls himself. And Kelsey Lawson, a Georgetown student and president of our Native American Student Council, will lead us in a ritual of land acknowledgement, which I'm sorry to say is not yet a regular practice in my experience on this campus, and I hope this will be part of um, changing that. Um, First, it's now my honor to hand the stage over and to introduce an extraordinary friend of mine and of the labs for more than a decade, a frequent visitor to Georgetown, member of the lab's think tank, host of ours in Sudan, UNESCO ambassador for peace, vi vice president and general secretary of International Theater Institute, and the founder of Al Buga Theater Company in Sudan, one of the world's most significant examples of transformative theater in zones of conflict my friend Ali Mahdi Nouri, who will lead us in an offering. Thank you guys so much. Now we, we try to complete the wedding. He talked to my friend Derek about the wedding. <laughs> so I'm going to lead a very simple thing. 
maybe it look new. But I believe very much we are here from different places. We came together to be together. I think, I believe, I'm flying like almost 24 hours to reach here. Not to give this short speech, but to see, to see you and to take from you something to my country, to my people, to Africa. I'm sure all of us here, as an artist, all the effort for the welfare of the human being. And you, I'm quite sure you know how the difficulties in the conflict zone. I've been working for the last 15 years to use the performance art in solving the problems, building the peace, dialogue. So let us pray together. I want you to stand up if you don't mind. And each one put his hand to the his neighbor. Yes. Like that. Yes. Find a friend. Find a friend. That will and if you can close your eyes, that will be good. Definitely the God will see you, but close your eyes. <laughs> so let us, I, I, will, I will pray, first in Arabic, and I will translate it. I need you to close the prayer with me. Each paragraph will say, Amin. Let us try. Amin. Amin. Where are you? <laughs> it's too far. Eh? So, Amin. Amin. Yes, give me energy. Amin. 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 God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> oh God, we are here. We are an artist. The only tool we have is our art, our performance. So please help us to bring peace to the whole world. Amin. 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 Oh God. We are fighting for the human being, for the welfare of the human being. So help us. Amen. 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 I hope we are sharing the idea to solve the problem. Amen. Amen. I hope with our performance we can help the development in the poor country. Amen. Amen. Every child finds a chance to get his education. Amen. Amen. Everybody can eat. Amen. Amen. Everybody can see what he wants and his full right to have what he wants. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. So now can we jump in the same place? I please. <laughs> because uh, Jason just landed from Narm in what we call Australia and I think hasn't slept for 35 hours. <laughs> it's no comparison but I got up at 5 which I never do <laughs> and Kelsey's in the middle of the exams. So we're here in full power but you know, I'm going to read because I need to. Um, I'm Emily Johnson and I'm a Yupik 
woman who grew up on Dena'ina and Kanaiti land in Alaska, and I live now on Manhattan uh, in Lenape Hoking. And I moved to New York City about five years ago, and it took me a long time, a few years, to build a relationship with Lenape land and people and ancestors. And my life is very much the better for it. And I work and I live in acknowledgement and respect to this ongoing relationship and to my dependence on Lenape land and water. And so the rest of what I have to say here uh, comes from this place and from this experience and from knowing how long it takes to build a relationship. And I also know how important it is to do so. I stand here with you on the unceded homelands of the Piscataway Indian Nation. And I offer my deepest respect and gratitude to Piscataway people and their ancestors from the past and into the future. I say to my hello to all indigenous people present here right now. And to any Piscataway people who might be here right now and who want to be acknowledged, please say so. So I ask you all to join me in gratitude to each other, to this gathering, and to everyone who made it happen, and most importantly, to this land and the people from this land who hold us. To be honest, I don't have permission to be here. I have not yet been introduced to nor met the Scottaway leaders. I haven't yet asked them if I can be here to do this work. And yet, I got up this morning, I boarded a train, and I assumed a permission. I assumed this position to stand in front of you and to speak. And isn't that something how we all assume permissions? Isn't it something how, is it because we're inside this building, or is it because we're inside this institution, both spaces dramatically separated from land, we assume we can enter, just come in and do whatever we want, even though this land is the unceded territory of the sovereign nation of the Piscataway. So I know that we are all here to do good, to do good work, to engage in fellowship, and to build kinship across borders, and to make good change. So what if we could, as a very powerful group of people, commit to doing our work in ways that do not copy and therefore reinstate violent acts of dispossession? I offer this acknowledgement on behalf of myself, of Kelsey, and of Jason. I know that we've been brought here for this purpose, but we do not stand in as proxy for Piscataway people. And our presence, as wonderful as it is, does not make absence okay. This acknowledgement is not on behalf of Georgetown University, because they have not yet done the work to build proper relations with local Piscataway leaders, and they have not yet fully supported Kelsey and other indigenous students who are working to include indigenous students through increased enrollment, representation, and cultural sensitivity on this campus. Kelsey will talk about that a little bit more in some of her other deeper. Jason is here to offer protocol. But the local leaders he should be extending this to aren't here. So let's all, myself included, do better. And in this effort, I also ask you to stand up. And likewise, please close your eyes and take a deep breath. And for a moment, as your eyes are closed, let your body relax and let yourself feel completely present in this room. And feel your feet, not on this floor, but actually on the ground beneath us. I ask you 
as fellow guests here on Piscataway land, to pay attention to this land, to offer thanks to this ground for holding you here, and to begin exchange with this ground what you need to exchange. Maybe you've never said hello to this sovereign territory, so maybe you could begin there. I ask that throughout this week, you remember this moment, this connection to ground. And when you remember this moment, I ask you to pause and to pledge an exchange. And perhaps that exchange is another moment of stillness. Perhaps it is another moment of appreciation and gratitude. <coughs> but perhaps also, it could be an internal wrestling with the fact that you benefit simply by being here from the fact this land was stolen and from the ongoing processes and effects of the continuation of colonization. And beyond an apology or a feeling of sorrow that might arise and beyond words, I ask you to think right now of actions you will commit to actions of reciprocity, actions of change, actions that will support indigenous nations as we build equity, actions you can offer to Piscataway people so that we support this land rather than just assume permission to take what we want. Closing, take one more deep breath together and bring your energy back up from the ground into this room. And hold those actions in your hearts and in your minds as we go through the week. And open your eyes when you're ready. And I say, Kuyana, thank you. And here's Kelsey. culture and politics and my major concentration is indigenous studies at least that's what I intended for it to be um, so first and foremost I wanted to just reiterate that I think it's important that we pay respects to the Piscataway peoples and call attention to the need for a better established relationship between Georgetown University and the people whose land we're standing on right now I would like to thank the lab specifically Ali and Derek for reaching out to the Native American Student Council and allowing us to participate in this incredible opportunity. Um, our tiny group of four Native students has been working tirelessly to advocate for more Indigenous visibility and recognition at Georgetown. We started circulating our petition aimed at providing support services for Native students on March 18th, and we received upwards of 600 signatures from undergraduates, approximately 400, uh, graduates, staff, faculty members, and even Congresswoman Deb Holland, uh, one of the first two Native Americans ever elected to Congress. Very Georgetown experience, I'm still processing it. <laughs> uh, we know that the Georgetown community is supportive of our cause, and because of this, we need to hold the administration accountable. We delivered our petition to the President's office on April 3rd, and yesterday we were able to meet with the Provost and discuss what the University can do moving forward in order to ensure that Native students have a space and community on the hilltop. We were also able to discuss the importance of communication between Georgetown and the Piscataway peoples. While a symbolic land acknowledgement is something that we think is necessary for the university to implement, and something we call for in our petition, we want to recognize that this alone is not enough. Georgetown University is currently proposing to raise 240 acres in the Nanjimoy Forest, which is ancestral Piscataway land, um, in Maryland for a solar, solar project that would power half the school. While green energy is a step in the right direction, there needs to be a recognition of the uh, need for consent from affected indigenous communities. Without explicit tribal consultation, the university is committing an internationally recognized human rights violation. There are alternative sites that can be utilized for this solar project. Renewable energy can be done in a manner that benefits everyone. 
So I'm urging you uh, to contact the Office of Sustainability at Georgetown. Um, I don't know the exact email address. But you can go. Um, <laughs> and just advocate for the rights of the Piscataway peoples. Um, again, uh, our club would like to thank the lab for hosting us today and for giving us space to engage in this important dialogue. We urge everyone in attendance to be aware of how they can engage in advocacy work pertaining to indigenous communities and their human rights on a local level and be cognizant of what injustices might be occurring to the people whose ancestral lands we're standing on right now. Thank you. Tell lies that the space is empty. That's not true. The story goes back a long, long way. Acknowledge the moon, the sun, the mountains, the trees, the rivers. We call it our dreaming, it's our story, our law. Great serpent, he created our country. I'm a tribal Aboriginal man. Yorta Yorta. Snake dreaming, emu dreaming, and treaty dreaming. Jajaron, the black crow. Wow. The rapper rap, pelican dream. The law of the land. I come to this space. It's not empty. You can feel it. We acknowledge spirit. The spirit's here. Mm. I thank you for letting me be here today, to be with both of you. It's the first time in my life I've come this far to connect with people of the land. Really special. We speak for country, we dance for country, we paint for country, we speak, <coughs> sing, we love our country, this is healing, we speak for the land, this sticks. Is a story from my home. Ten thousand, fifty thousand years ago. The Lord 
more skill there. People call this a didgeridoo, it's a yiddiki. Traditional instrument. This one's not mine. I borrowed it here today. I'll see how it works. <laughs> One law back at home, what do I do? I'm a ceremony man. Uh, I'll come here to tell a story to all of you about theft of our old people from our land and taken around the world for science. It's important that our people come home. It brings peace to the land, to the children, to our elders, to everyone. That's part of the right work that I do, like a lot of us. So much that is a very hard act to follow. Uh, I am uh, Cynthia Schneider. I'm the co-director with Derek of the lab. I know many of you, but not all of you. And those of you who I don't know, I I hope I listen to you. I am the politics and diplomacy side of the lab. And I work with Derek through the lab out of a deep 
belief in the power of culture and the really misunderstood and under-leveraged power of culture in the world today. And it's very moving for me to say this, oh, really moving, to say this in front of Professor Wole Soinka because it was his words in the year 2000 at the White House Conference on Cultural Diplomacy that first sparked this idea for me and really have guided me ever since. Uh, Professor Soyinka, one of several keynote speakers at this Conference on Cultural Diplomacy, said with reference to the conflict in the Middle East, he spoke about the demonizing nature of politics in opposition to the humanizing capacity of culture and wondered why, in efforts to resolve conflict, we didn't pay more attention to the humanizing capacity of culture. And I look out here and I see people I know, and I'm sure many I don't, who are there on the front lines working in conflict areas, whether it's Ali Noor. Many of you who are jo Jonathan Hollander using your capacity, your art, to bring people together to enable people to imagine peace again. You know, you can't build peace if you can't imagine what that future is. And that is what the narratives and the performances that all of you create, leverage, enable others to create, which is just as important. You know, I'm really not in favor of this traditional idea of cultural diplomacy of we will Thank you, you all are so lucky, bring American things all over the world. That was great in the 1950s. But now is a time where I do believe America and other developed countries do have capacity. It's the capacity to leverage local voices. And those are the voices who will be listened to. Those are the voices who will make a difference. And that is what we try to do at the lab. That's why we bring this wonderful production of Chibok Girls and many others here and put them before, and we try to get them here, put them before uh, the policy makers, the decision makers in Washington. Because while I think it's wonderful that the Department of Education and Cultural Affairs funds artists to go around the world, I think those artists belong on the seventh floor. They belong in the situation room. They belong where the decisions are being made. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And in all honesty, I've been trying to do that for 10 years, so you can tell how successful I've been. But it's wonderful to try to do it with Derek at Georgetown at the lab with our wonderful lab fellows, with our wonderful staff, and our extraordinary Georgetown community. And we are so lucky to have, um, as part of our community, the person who expresses these ideas more eloquently than anyone else, these ideas of the importance of creativity and imagination. And that is Azar Nafisi. You will know her. Uh, from her books, reading Lolita in Tehran, and her fascinating book on looking at America through literature, The Republic of Imagination. She's hard at work on a new book now, but kindly has given us some of her time, and we're so lucky at the lab to have had her at Georgetown as a Centennial Fellow uh, this semester. And so, Azar, would you please come forward and share a few thoughts with us? We, uh, I'm sorry not to give you a whole program of Azar. We did that with the Republics of Imagination. But. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. I just, um, over the past uh, few weeks, I've been involved with Cross Currents and with Derek and Cynthia and uh, all the wonderful people they have worked with. And one person ha keeps coming to my mind, so I thought I'd just begin by 
um, a quotation from our beloved James Baldwin when he, to welcome you by saying that artists are here to disturb the peace. So, you know, begin the disturbance, I think, of those who have been disturbing our peace. You know, I was just watching the news for about 10 minutes before I came here, and the, the conflicts and the wars and the war that is broiling in our own backyard here um, in uh, the democratic America, and then we have 42 representatives from all parts of the world, where those countries that are at war one an with one another, you have the representatives here who are here despite the conflicts and the wars and not because of them, and who refuse to comply with the limitations, uh, with the impositions that are imposed on them, the limitations of um, nationality, religion, ethnicity, gender, um, or race. They rebel against these, um, uh, in these limitations. Now against this, they become the voices of those who, whose voices have been taken away from them. And I was wondering against this uniformity that is being imposed on us, no matter which part of the world we live in, what is the best weapon that artists have? And I thought that the most important weapon artists have is their curiosity. You know, Vladimir Nabokov used to say, curiosity is insubordination in its purest form. And the reason for it is that you constantly, because you're curious, you have to come from out of your skin and go under the skin of others to constantly perceive the world through the alternative eyes of the others. And so that is what artists do constantly. That is why they are such great disturbers of peace. And once you come out of your skin, you know, and you celebrate difference and diversity, you discover it is not enough to simply celebrate diversity. You have to also be careful about something that those with authoritarian and totalitarian mindsets create. They use difference in order to oppress us. They use difference in order to silence us. The Jews in Nazi Germany were different from us. The, those who were sent to gulags in Soviet Union were different from us. The, even in a democratic country like U US, Muslims are different from us. Refugees and immigrants are different from us. They're rapists, they're criminals. So we have to understand that there's a difference between just talking about that kind of difference and the kind of diversity that we talk about. And the best thing that art does is alongside of curiosity, it brings with it empathy. It does literally what the narrator in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird talks about, makes you go under someone else's skin and walk around in it for a little while. And it is this empathy that connects us. Primo Levi, when he um, was freed from the concentration camps, used to say, I write in order to rejoin the community of mankind. And that is what uh, empathy, that is what art, that is what literature, that is what works of imagination and ideas are about, to rejoin constantly the community of mankind. And so uh, I wanted to end uh, by uh, something that, again, working with Derek and Cynthia and the cross currents um, brought to my mind. It was a memory that had been silenced in me for a long time, and it came out through this program, and I want to end by that. Uh, I had, when I was in Iran, I had a student uh, whose name was Razie, and uh, she was um, an Orthodox Muslim girl who was in love with Henry James's um, uh, women, 
especially Daisy Miller and uh, the Catherine in Washington Square. And that is how cultures speak to one another. That a young girl in the Islamic Republic of Iran can communicate with a man who was born in 19th century, a country called America. That Razier becomes the person who confirms Henry James. Anyway, to make a long story short, after a few years after I had not seen her, one of my students who had been to jail with Razier told me that um, uh, Razier was in jail with her and the last days that they were together, they were talking about the great Gatsby and Henry James. And a few days after that, Razier was executed. And I always, I always think of this and think of Razier and think of someone like Primo Levi who says when he was in the concentration camp, his only hope was that he can tell his French cellmate about Dante. And I think to myself, what is it that makes people who are at death's door, who have nothing more to live for, think of Henry James or Dante? Would Henry James or Dante save their lives? Obviously not. But one thing they had at the death's door was to choose how they will face death, that they will face death with dignity. And what reminded them in the darkest hours of their lives, when you know about atrocities that make you despair in being human, what reminded them, what brought hope to them, what reminded them of life was what celebrates the dignity and the integrity of, the imagina of, of life. And that is works of imagination, which is all about the individual integrity and dignity, no matter where they come from. So, you know, this is the kind of gathering where water is turned into wine. And I want to drink to curiosity, to empathy, and to truth, and to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kendall Long. I'm a senior here at Georgetown, double majoring in government and African American studies. I'm fortunate to say in just 10 days, I'll be walking across the stage graduating. <laughs> <laughs> On the front end of my Georgetown experience, uh, less than 10 days before classes start, I learned about Georgetown's history of slavery uh, through an email that was sent out by our, our, our President uh, John DeJoya. Uh, this prompted a wave of student protests from rallies, sit-ins, and teach-ins, uh, pressing Georgia University's administration to act on its history of slavery memory reconciliation, both on campus and in descendant communities. In fall of 2017, this work was actualized uh, when the first uh, known descendant of, of these efforts enrolled at Georgia University. Since then, uh, me and Melisande short who will take the stage shortly, have had the pleasure of sharing many laughs together, we've learned together in classrooms, and most recently we've organized together in what's come to, what's come to known as the GE 272 referendum that creates a student-led and student-funded reconciliation fund to benefit descendants. I'm fortunate to uh, be a student here at Georgetown with Melly. Uh, she's a bright, light, a bright light on campus. Uh, with her presence, she reminds us of our collective responsibility to be a critical and responsible critical and reflective of our collective history of slavery at Georgetown. And also being from New Orleans, she also happens to be an excellent chef. <laughs> it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Ms. Melisande Short Cologne. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Georgetown. Thank you so much for coming. It's a wonderful day. I met Derek and Cynthia in uh, November, December of 2016, when they were coming to New Orleans to 
meet descendants of the recently revealed Georgetown Jesuit slave sale. Um, so I made dinner and invited everybody to come over. And we had a wonderful evening, uh, food, wine, conversation, and a bond was forged that night in my heart between Derek and Cynthia and myself and the lab. Um, the last couple of years here at Georgetown University have been challenging. I am very much an adult student and out of the habit of all that goes into being a student. I've been a grown up for a really, really long time. <laughs> so last semester, I had a class with Derek and with Kendall, and our work was centered around memory. And how do we remember? And what do we remember? And why we remember? So I started working on this little piece uh, in class. That was a class project. And Derek and Cynthia have been nothing but encouraging. So I'm going to read you a few little excerpts today of what I hope will become a larger performance piece um, and a memorial, a memoriam, an honor, uh, and an acknowledgment of the involuntary founders of Georgetown University and the United States of America. How many of you wanted to be a princess? when you grew up. My professor asked this of a class of eager students as we grappled with complex theories of Aquinas, Paley, and Freud. I smiled broadly in my internal self. You see, I never wanted to be a princess. I was born a queen. I know this because my grandmother told me so emphatically with no hesitation, trepidation, or fear of misrepresentation. You, child, are a queen. I'm here because others who are not me loved me in the past and prayed me into existence in the present. <clears throat> Queen Mahoney, voice one. Our hearts are a secret treasure map, often lost, sometimes forgotten, discovered again, broken, and incomplete. There are rivers of, of fate, mountains of predestination, valleys of grief, and lakes of pure comfort. There are footprints here and trees that cast long shadows from what has been onto what may be. Grandmother's bodies made of tears, fears, hopes, and dreams, a vision and a fragment of every womb that has come before me came into me as whispered incantations that knit my bones, blood, and spirit to the past and to the future. Deep inside a daughter's womb, precious life to precious life, value to value, so necessary and so loved, our story is forever. My deepest gratitude lies in all that is yet to be discovered. This is worth the treasure. I cannot tell what I do not know, and I know so much less than I can carry. My back is strong, my legs are straight, 
despite the weight of this ignoble weight. My heart is made for treasure, and the sound of rain on my moon-bright skin taps out a heartbeat again and again. I have been a wanderer all of my life, although I have not always wandered. The story looms larger, and now we must all travel even farther. The rain lows, the rain slows, the story comes to a pause. Surely the rain will come again. Queen Mary, 1715. <clears throat> Ending illusions is hard. And hurt comes with that. But strength and determination often follow heartbreak and tears. The disruption in the fragile fabric of the lives of 272 people was heartless, cruel, and for the greater good, just not theirs. They would receive their reward later in the bosom of Jesus and with me standing here today. Through the Georgetown Memory Project who found me, I was put in contact with other identified descendants. There are over 8,000 of us now. <clears throat> we set about the work of reconnecting our families, Kith and Ken, all over the world, and we are many. Father Anthony Coleman, Society of Jesus, <clears throat> White Marsh Plantation, <coughs> excuse me, 1850. You are certain that none of you will be sold, nor your children, except such as, except such as shall show themselves disobedient to the overseer, rebellious and incorrigible. For such we will not suffer in this place. You ought to consider this farm and to work as if it belonged to you. Because we consider you our brethren in Christ. Reverend Peter Haverman Society of Jesus, 1838. How sad. These days have passed and I am not able to say. The slaves with heroic fortitude are giving themselves to fate and with Christian resignation, relinquishing themselves to God. One woman, more pious than the others, and at the time, pregnant, most demanded my compassion. She was coming toward me, so for the last time she could greet me and seek benediction and she observes, observed as she was genuflecting.
if, if ever someone should have reason to despair, do I not now have it? I do not know on what day the birth will come, whether on the road or on the sea, what will become of me? Why do I deserve this? I was saying, trust in God. So it was. She agreed. I offered myself totally to her. All were coming to me, seeking rosaries, metal, a cross, so that they would remember me. And how, with so much obedience, they went to the boat. The Queens from White Marsh Plantation, Harriet and her seven children, from St. Indigo's Plantation, Robert and Mary Mahoney, and their 10 children, the largest single family group in a slave sale of over 300 people, some of them yet unborn. Harriet Queen, I'm sorry, Mary Ellen Queen, age 17, and Abraham Mahoney, age 16, boarded a boat called the Uncas in 1838 and began their lives in a new place, in a new way that ends with me here today. This is the day for which we were made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mally. Um, very brief, I promise I'm not going to make a long speech again. Um, the, um, uh, you have these moments when you're planning an event like this, and this is, I look out now, seeing your faces, where just an email comes, and it's one of you saying, I'm coming, and it's like, wow, that's a bit, that's a really special uh, contributor, and this is one of those um, people, um, and I just wanted the person who was going to be here to introduce him, there's sort of nothing more intimate and powerful, I think, than uh, as many of us have done, than um, <clears throat> sharing a brilliant student across time and space. And one of our amazing lab fellows, Asif Majid, um, is a student who uh, was uh, here at Georgetown and has been working with um, uh, at University of Manchester. And um, so I'm in his place, but I wanted to acknowledge him because um, uh, he's not able to be here with us. And he is a, a big missing piece of things this week. And I just want to um, uh, uh, bring to the stage. Many of you know I, I encountered James Thompson's work first as a graduate student under Dwight Conkergut and it, it changed my life and my way of thinking. Um, he's been doing incredible things um, uh, as a sort of uh, leader um, uh, in, at, at the University of Manchester, but we also know him um, as professor of applied theater, but through his work in Place of War and uh, longtime work around artists in war zones and theater and communities. Um, but his more recent work struck me as an important part of our um, uh, of why we're here. It's really, really beautiful and moving work around performance and care, and he's also looking at love. So I want to bring to the stage Professor Thompson to talk about care. <laughs> Bye.
Thank you very much, Derek. Um, and I am really uh, sad not to have been introduced by our mutual friend and uh, student at the University of Manchester called Asif, uh, and we obviously wish him well. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm really honoured and humbled to be speaking in this uh, opening session. I was actually uh, really delighted to be leaving the UK. Um, <laughs> it might seem really strange, but I was really, really pleased to be leaving the hostile, aggressive, divided and bitter atmosphere from my home country to come um, <laughs> to this oasis. Um, that's British sarcasm, I'm afraid. Um, but I am really pleased to be here. Um, and as many of you will know, we live back at home in the UK in a, a context of, of an economic policy that has been called austerity. Um, uh, and the origins of the word austerity quite simply just uh, mean cruel. Um, and of course, austere is also an aesthetic category. It also means ugly, grim, and artless. So, um, Back home, we're living in a time where being economically and socially cruel and artless is our official government policy. And this is tied to a time of rabid individualism where looking out for oneself, self-interest, self-fulfillment, individual success, and so on and so on, are the values guiding our society. And this leads to disunity, to violence, to a sense of entitlement, to austere, bloody, ugly walls. Now, in light of this, networking, collaborative events, where you come together for mutual support and learning and leaning on each other, are more and more important. And we shouldn't belittle the significance of being here, connecting and meeting and making new friends. There's three reasons for me. First, in a time of austere cruelty, networks of solidarity, trust, and care are vital to keep people strong, alive, and safe. But also, in a hyper-individualized world, valuing interconnection, interdependence, and mutual acts of co-creation, collaboration, and support is in fact counter-cultural. And therefore, saying, I need others to survive and thrive is an act of resistance. And finally, because I would argue that the best acts of solidarity and care are in themselves artistic. They have a craft, an embodied skill, and a sense of beauty. They can be anti-austere, making friends Connecting and holding on to people to create networks is an art practice. A good, mutually supportive interconnection is an art form. It's noisy, fun, celebratory, bright and colourful. Being here in the next few days, we are making and sustaining quality relationships as an art-making exercise. A change of tack. My interest in the idea of looking after each other as an art form came from an incident in 2011, when very sadly a number of my colleagues were killed in eastern Congo. It's a long story for another time, and there is no intention here to dishonour this incident in discussing it so briefly. One outcome of this was that a Congolese colleague and friend called Antoine ended living with me and my family in the UK while he had an operation on his bullet wound to his elbow. And there he went through a long process of recovery and recuperation. In this time, he develops an amazing relationship with a physiotherapist who coaxed his arm, his hand, and fingers back to life. My family and I both commented how the touch, the tender care between them was an act of beauty. There was a mutual attentiveness respect and attunement that was astounding. And this then encouraged me to wonder why we had used a term from the arts to describe an act of care. Antoine 
eventually returned to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and is now working there in the town of Vivira in South Kivu. In remembering Antoine and mourning those friends, I've become interested in care and the ethics of care as an art form and have been searching out examples of small and larger scale care which has an embodied, crafted and aesthetic quality. I have a hunch that the best acts of mutual solidarity, affection, whether between two individuals or between wider communities in struggle or in the way that people care for the environment, at their best are art forms themselves. I've been searching for acts of artful care and careful art, which I think are vital for both our survival and resistance to our deeply careless times. Beautiful care is an anti-austerity practice. And this then returns me to my first opening point. I'm really pleased to be here because I'm excited to meet people, learn from different practices. In cruel times, artists in our smallest interactions need to think about the aesthetics of the relationships we build. Caring for each other is a craft we need to practice, to provide respite and ultimately resistance to cruel, careless and downright ugly times. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, we're moving to the final um, phase of this first session, and it is sort of going to provide a, a model and a segue for the activity that we're going to do in the second session, which, in between which we will give you a, a break. Um, and so um, what we've done is um, uh, we'll be participating in a kind of what we're calling hopeful encounters. And these are pair conversations. Um, in very much in the spirit of what James was just saying and what I think this whole session has gotten at. I've come to be a big believer in the power of conversations that happen in pairs, in one-to-one -one ways and different forms of those. We have work we've been doing called, uh, around uh, a process called performing one another, and this is kind of a variation on that. Um, so what we've done, as many of you know, for the next session, there's a group. It's not everybody, but there, there's a group of people who are present and attending who we've asked to um, uh, be part of these two-person hopeful encounter dialogues, which we'll do in multiple spaces after our break, and we'll explain and divide. But we're going to model that process with um, our five lab fellows as a way um, both for you all to see a little bit more clearly what, the, what, that, what that looks like and uh, to get to know them better because they're pretty incredible. Um, so um, we're going to bring um, two chairs to the stage. Um, thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> Michael, Michael and Daniel. Um, and I think we're going to, um, because we're streaming, we're, even though we have, these guys all project really well, we're going to take a moment to support here. Um, and um, so, Can uh, have it here. No? <laughs> so nice to be here. Like, see all of these faces. Yeah. Yeah? Please. Okay, and you'll introduce yourself quick, uh, quickly to us, and then you'll have the conversation. Please, uh, please My name is Faisal. I'm uh, from Palestine. Okay. Faisal, uh, what gives you hope? What gives you hope? Oh, we decide there's more question before, and then you come back to this. 
No, no, we're jumping. Okay. Uh, actually, yeah, it's hard to be hopeful sometimes, but but I think um, because I was ready for the other question, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like no, no, no. Seriously, seriously. What's giving me hope? I think when I see people laughing, and when I see a lot of smiles around, because I feel we are communicate better when we laugh and when we smile. And personally, what's giving me hope as Faisal. Like my new show was selected for Sundance. Woo! <laughs> so to to develop it this year, 2019 in July in Utah. Utah, I said right? Yes. Utah. So I'm I'm very hopeful about that, and I'm looking forward. And yeah, that's what gives me hope these days. <laughs> so I've been I've been really lucky to see Faisal your work uh, in uh, in the UK about about your uh, your childhood and, and your your growing up in Palestine. Uh, so how does your how does your work respond in a hopeful way? Yeah, that you should ask the audience, not me. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I don't know. Like you know, sometimes sometimes it's like when we, when you it was the show called Showtime from the front line. It's about this. It was a story about comedy club in Palestine with the British comedian Mark Thomas. So it was a bit kind of a I don't know if it's hope or not, but people were like. Breaking the stereotype of Palestinian, like you know, sometimes when you when you hear Palestine, all suddenly everybody expect yeah, poof, boom, some somewhere, or you know, there's always a story they wanna reflect that on you. One minute, one minute remaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the middle of like you know, passion, <laughs> catching the audience. Boom, one minute. Yeah. So this is a uh, that's. That was the, <laughs> I lost the point, <laughs> but yeah. So where we are, show, show time from the front line. Yeah, uh, and th uh, this show, what, well, what's made, breaking the stereotype of Palestinian, of who we are, and we, and that's, yeah, like, you know, it doesn't have to be always about, you know, we are bah, 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 war and you know, bombs. No, we can, we can be funny sometimes. <laughs> so that was the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. 10 yeah. seconds. Ten seconds. What else gives you hope? What else gives me hope? Ten, five. Uh, 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 my clown. I'm a clown. <laughs> my clown gives me hope. Alright. Yeah. Thank you. Now stand. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hello, Lani. Where are we going? Yeah, we are good. Yes, go. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Could you please introduce your, uh, yourself and where you come from? Sure. My name is uh, Valani Diva. I go by Lani. I am a uh, Polynesian West African theater maker. I live in New York City right now. Um, yeah. Uh, and how is it to be here? To be here at this at yeah, the gathering the specifically. Day. It's amazing. This is sort of the. Um, when I, you know, when I thought about going into theater when I was younger, this something like this it would have been above my wildest dreams. Um, something like the gathering, where you know there's a, such a focus on, um, like, what is the art that we're trying that we make actually mean, rather than like what does it aesthetically do or what is, you know. So that's something that I'm really, really grateful to see as a conversation that's um, growing now. I'm really happy to be a part of it. Right now, what gives me hope is um, this current generation of, of people, and I mean those who are younger than me. Um, I think the, the people who are coming out of high school right now, who are going into their undergraduate programs, are, um, are so much better than, than I feel like I was at demanding what they understand to be deserved um, of them. I think they, I think. Are you clapped? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think I think you know I I think I I I feel like I grew up in a time, and I'm not you know I'm I'm only a few years older, but I feel like I grew up at a time where um, you got by be being a minority who knew their place and who knew how to play the rules and who knew how to fit into certain spaces, and I feel like um, I'm really humbled and inspired by people who are um, finding ways to um, 
live in, in, in these places where, you know, like I, I don't know any other West African Polynesian people, um, but people who are finding ways to synthesize the places where they currently live in, and retain those as their own home spaces, and also um, in embracing the full complexity that is their own identities, and I think that's something that's really amazing. Uh, One minute. Yesterday Thank you shared with me that you are, you are you this year uh, you direct three shows. Yes. Could you <laughs> like, like how, how does it feel like from, and you said it's every, every show is different than that. Yes. So how you deal with that as, a, as an actor, as a director? As a director, yeah. Um, actually, uh, there's so one of the shows is actually going to be um, performing here on Friday, so you guys should all come and see it. It's called um, Apologies to the Bengali Lady, and it's written by a phenomenal, phenomenal um, theater artist named uh, Anya Banerjee, and it's about um, Shakespeare's legacy in the Bengal region of India. Um, so that's super exciting, and that's um, a shorter, straight play that's about really complicated cultural issues. Um, the other play that I, you know, uh, another play that I directed earlier this year was called Better, and it was about um, addiction recovery and, and immersive theater experience, which is another very different um, piece. And it, it also had comedy in it and things like that. Um, another. Ten seconds. So, so just using those two as an example, um, I think th uh, what's helped me get in and out of those is focusing on um, the specific point of that piece, even though form-wise they're different. Um, I think there's, there's, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just focus. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think focusing on like what is that piece specifically trying to do has been my saving grace in terms of getting it in and out. Last thing. Last thing. <laughs> 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 what gives you hope also more? Uh, what more, more also gives me hope? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, 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 um, what gives me hope? Um, uh, yeah. You, Faisal. <laughs> <laughs> Say where you're from, what you do. Hello, I am Manuel Duveros from Cali, Colombia, South America. Uh, <laughs> from uh, 2017, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm pursuing my graduate certificate in African American Theater and uh, my MFA in Performance Theater in Unifa University of Louisville. Good time. Louisville. 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 <laughs> where shall I say the word? That's all. <laughs> with what gives you hope, Chris? Do we? Mm -hmm. oh. Just we, we, we'll build off of We that. need anesthesia. Okay. <laughs> um, doing theater, mm -hmm. um, when I perform and I see the face of the people, because I, most of the time I feel how doing theater, I can see what, how the people are thinking and connecting. Actually, everybody here are connecting, and you know, the people can sit next to the other and like, you can see in their faces like, the, yes, we are connected. And we are thinking the same thing. We are building something. We are feeling something. And I, feel it's, I think it's the same thing. Do you think there are things that, um, that theater can do that, because I know you do a lot of different things. Mm. Are there things specifically about theater that you think enable it to do things that maybe other art forms can't? Just curious. Excuse me? Are there things that you think theater can do um, that maybe other forms of art can't as well, I guess. Or what do you think that is, is specific Okay, a short, yeah. short thing that happened. The first time I came to U.S. with a play, we have a scene when I um, smash a plantain and take out a huge uh, plantain chip. Okay. Yeah, and in that scene, I, have, I bring my father who came in a well chair. And at the end of the play, we have a conversation, and there was a Bolivian girl who was watching the play, and she tell us about how we make her think about her parents and the food that he, she she gets when she was a girl. And we start after that, all the conversation moves about the food. I love, I love to cook, <laughs> and it was good because theater in that moment um, moves the conversation towards something that everybody knows and. We feel comfortable about talking about that. Yeah, could you That's talk a little bit, um, just to build off of that, your relationship with food is something that I think is beautiful and wonderful. Um, you said, it says here, you, Manuel loves to cook. Um, <laughs> what, 
what is it about food that you feel also um, is something that's important for people? One minute. When I am cooking, it's like when I'm doing theater. Mm -hmm. I have an idea, but in the process, usually I finish. I, at the end, I do something that I didn't know what I, that I can do. Like, okay, this is my idea about the play. I want to direct, I want to act in. And at the end, it's other thing better than I thought. And that's the same thing when I say, okay, I want to cook salmon tonight. And I try to put this. Maybe I can put this. Maybe I can do Hmm, that's good. Can't <laughs> myself. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's how it is. How much time do you have? Ten, Ten seconds. seconds. One more Nine. thing that gives you hope. Um, you all. This is space. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Hello, Caitlin. Hi. I think um, I want to say that I think Manuel and I belong together because he says I love to cook and I say I like homemade meals. <laughs> To be. You can talk about <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> After. I have my first question. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us who you are? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Caitlin Nesma Cassidy. Um, you're welcome to call me Kate. My family calls me Kate. You guys are family. Um, uh, I am an actor and a theater maker, um, currently based in New York City. Um, my work is really interested in the relationship between myth and science. Um, and when I'm not in New York, I'm in various parts of the Middle East working there. Good. My first question is, what do you get for breakfast? <gasps> Every morning of my life, <laughs> I eat the same thing. <laughs> I eat peanut butter on pita bread. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's really unglamorous. <laughs> and coffee, of course. Coffee. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That gives me hope. We talked about okay, that. Okay, now we can go move to the, to the point. Um, tell me, what gives you hope? What gives me hope? Um... What gives me hope is people who show up to the work with joy. Um, I'm thinking so much about how joy is often seen, I think, as, um, as less muscular than rage or um, for the uninformed. Um, there's a beautiful poem that I love. Uh, it's called um, Mad Farmer Liberation Front by Wendell Berry. And it says, yeah, some of you have read it. Um, it says, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Mm. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so that is, um, in my life, something I'm working really hard to cultivate, and I'm trying to surround myself with people like you who give me um, joy, because I think that's what keeps us alive, what keeps us energized, what keeps us moving forward, forward what reminds us that, um, that it is possible um, to carry on. Uh, even when things feel like they're in crisis, which they often do. Um, I'm doing a lot of work as well on the environment, um, which feels like a never-ending contention with grief. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so to practice joy and to be around people who practice joy um, most days feels like the most revolutionary thing that I can do. Good. One minute, last question. Okay, talking about environment, uh, supposing and metaphorically this is a campfire, everybody brings something as fuel to yeah. make a huge fire. What do you bring to burn here and what do you hope to take with you? Oh, what a beautiful question. Um, wow. Make, burn, make, make burn, and burn. Make and burn. Okay, I have a minute to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do I hope to bring? I hope I hope to bring listening. Um, I'm I'm trying to I'm going to be a sponge. I'm trying to be open this week. That's my that's my intention. Um, and so I suppose maybe that's the thing I'm bringing and also taking. But I don't know. I guess I guess the thing I'm trying to burn is maybe joy. That's my fuel. There you go. You. Then. Yeah. <laughs> Me. <laughs> well, thank <you>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Manuel. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Full circle. Yeah. Up. All right. Two small women. Here we go. Um, oh, thank you. 
Uh, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> hey, my name is Devika Ranjan. I uh, am an Indian American. I'm a theater maker. I'm a teacher. Um, many hats. Um, what brings you joy? Oh, what brings you hope? What gives you hope? <laughs> that was my answer. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Uh, I think I think they're similar, right? Uh, what what brings me joy and what brings me hope? I think they're connected, um, and that's uh, that's that's people um, and communities and uh, and surrounding myself, right? Uh, James Thompson just said just said that we 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 have people and we thrive and survive, right? We we have to have that, um, and uh, just listening to everybody today, I'm feeling I'm feeling that hope, um, Jason. Jason was talking about how the path has been forged, um, and that made me feel very, very hopeful. So, so I guess not only the communities that we're around right now, but the communities who have come before us and who are still, still with us, which was such a needed reminder today. Thank you. Is there a specific community in your life that is bringing you hope now in the present? In, in this present, it's the Lab Fellows. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's the Lab Fellows, and it's it's sort of this uh, this this extended community that we're going to have in these few days. Um, what a what a what a place to be in! Uh, I'm so grateful to s to meet all of you who are who are doing the work that I wish for, um, and that I kind of imagine, and and it is beyond my imagining. I'm so grateful. Mm. Um. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the work you're doing? Devika does a lot of work um, in particular around surveillance and migration. Um, and how are you finding ways to build communities, particularly in places where people may feel like they don't have them? Mm. Surveillance is interesting. Thank you. Surveillance is interesting because, uh, because it sort of feels like we are uh, we're watched, right? And we're being, f we're, we're being seen as a community. Um, and it's it's sort of the most unintended community, isn't it? Um, but uh, but I have I have the absolute privilege of working uh, with people who are displaced um, or have migrated as as refugees, as asylum seekers, as immigrants of any kind. Um, and it's been it's been a real joy to to use theater as a way to bring people together, people who have never done theater before, who ne who you know who don't identify as actors or performers. Um, and uh, it's, it's been really amazing to, to forge communities in that way of, of people who come from such different places in the world and in, in their lives, uh, kind of uniting over these sort of games, like goofy things games. and food. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that brings me a lot of hope when, uh, when sometimes situations are really difficult. Thank you. Thank you. You're the best.